All right, so for Mongoose Traveler 2 GM 101, uh, we're going to start off by teaching how to set up your table for player connections, and then we're going to build and learn the features within the actual software. So we're going to start, we're going to assume this is our very first campaign uh, session. Think of a campaign like a, your, your kitchen table or your local game store. It's, it's your virtual tabletop. So we're going to start for the first time. We're going to click on Create Campaign. And as I'm looking at my screen, I do want to point out this is important. Up here is your, your, your ID, your username on Fantasy Grounds. That's important because if, if you write that down, you're going to hand that out to your players so they could find you on the cloud connection. So just that's where you could find it. So go ahead and create campaign. All right, we're going to have a, a game system rule sets. Uh, mine will look different than yours based on what we, what we own. Uh, because I own the Mongoose Traveler 2E core rule, it's one of the systems I, I could open. You should see these other Dungeons and Dragons ones probably because they have open game licenses. They don't require you to own the rule book. Same with maybe Fate and Numenera, some other stuff, Pathfinders. But uh, if you don't see Mongoose Traveler 2, it's probably because you don't own the core rule book yet. Uh, but if, if not, just go ahead and pick any system. Uh, Everything is going to be the same. It's just going to look and feel differently. But it, it is literally the same. So now that I have uh, my game system uh, selected, I'm going to call this whatever campaign is. Uh, so this is Friday Night Traveler, we'll, we'll say. What's today? Monday? We'll call it Monday Night Traveler. All right. And it's just a naming um, convention that we use to bin our data on our hard drive so we can find it easily. It's also uh, an easy view for your players when they search for your name. Uh, they'll, they'll know that they're, they're joining the right table. All right. And you, so you call it whatever, whatever's clever for you and your players. Next up is we're going to set a password. Uh, this is because I like putting my table on the cloud uh, where they could view it. Uh, but I don't want anybody to find me and connect, so I'll, I'll put a password. And for this session, I'll just call it FGC. Uh, chat name, by default, in-game, will come off as GM. Uh, I, I'm going to update it because it's Traveler. I'm going to call it Ref. Uh, next up. We have two options for our server type, cloud and LAN. With Fantasy Grounds Unity, uh, we can now host our session on the cloud, which eliminates the Fantasy Ground Classic port forwarding issues that, that we've had to deal with with this 1802 and fixing your firewalls. So recommend the cloud. Next is your server list that's public. I said, and that's what I was talking about, I like it public so my players could see the table name and they could also uh, only connect if I give them this password. All right. Next up are extensions. Extensions are bolt on to the software of Fantasy Grounds itself. Uh, so they come with items that you purchase at the Fantasy Grounds store, or they could be extensions that you download off the forums that are, are player made, or finally they could be something you purchase off of something like Drive Through RPG. Uh, for this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some of the decals that I own for Traveler so you can see what they will do when we get in-game. Do the players who are joining you have to select the same extensions, or do yours naturally just propagate to their systems as they log in? It'll go to their system as they log in. They won't see this screen at all. They're going to go to Join Campaign, and it'll look very different for them. Very good. Yeah, so this, this, whole, this whole thing, they won't see any of this. So, oh, here we go. So I'll do the high guard decals and the reach of adventure decals. We can play with those as we go. Um, that's about all we'll talk about this. If you do do a LAN, you do have to provide the IP. This is how you would, you just do a quick copy and, and give it to your players if you're comfortable with that. Okay. That's only if we select LAN to play, right? Yes. Instead correct. of the cloud? Yeah, yeah. If you select okay. cloud, this doesn't matter. I, would, I wish it was just kind of grayed out because I'm sure one of you is writing a uh, DNS attack on me right now. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go ahead. Everything looks good. Oh, and one last thing. Oh, big one. I almost forgot. So check for updates. The nice thing about Unity, there'll be a red box around the check for updates if you're behind on the current version. 
because it does when you do the launcher it'll check the uh, a top tier you know the cloud and see if you're current or not um, with unity it does matter on version uh, for what you and your players are on it may not let players join you if they're too far behind unlike in fantasy grounds classic where just they could join but you they trigger a bunch of errors sometimes it's a really out of date but this will give you an obvious check for updates right there all right everything looks good we're going to go ahead and start our session should take a less than i would say about 30 seconds what this is doing is taking my client uh, my host computer it is loading a session up into the the cloud so my data is currently transferring online and it's going to be a constant communication between the cloud server and my host machine they, they all they're always talking to each other now okay campaign setup uh, you can use this to to set up your campaign this class is going to be taught to do it all manually through the tools in, uh, in the menu on the right here um, but if you click through it, the first thing, we have some stuff that will take you to websites outside of the game. Uh, and then we'll do the data modules. It kind of does this logical order. At, and that's how I'm going to teach it. So I just went ahead and finished it. Uh, we're going we're gonna to actually show you where those buttons are so you understand what's going on. So you should see me in game now. I got my mouse going. Um, there are a couple of things that we want to do as a, as a referee before... We, we tell our players our table's ready for connection, or our host is ready, or our client's ready, however we want to term it. Um, if you look at the menu, and uh, the menu is this whole bar on the right. This is what I'll refer to as the menu. Um, we have a bunch of different buttons. And my biggest hang up when I started playing Fantasy Grounds a couple years ago is I had bought all this content online, I had the core rule, uh, I had an adventure, and I go to my story, and it is empty. There's nothing here. Well, what the heck? All right. It's because nothing is loaded in our library. So if you go down to the bottom right here, first thing I want to do as a ref or a player, but as definitely as a ref, I want to start managing my library. Uh, there is currently nothing active, so I'm going to go to my modules. And this is where all my information is stored. I uh, have to activate it. The reason it doesn't automatically activate it is because it, it, it uh, is resource driven. Uh, and if you, you load everything, uh, the connection, setting up your table could time out, it could take too long. Uh, players can might, might uh, bottleneck getting in if you, if you share too much of this with them. So um, that's why you have to go through and load your library manually. If it's a campaign, it'll save what you load for the next session. You don't have to do this every time you log into the game. Just the first time you create a campaign. Or if you buy a new a new book and you want to load it to your game, then you'll have to come back in here and load it. So we'll start with this. I'm not gonna do Well, I'm gonna load the I'm gonna load our, our calendar because I'm gonna show you what that does. Uh, the D66 Compendium, that is a supplement I got from uh, Smiteworks off the Fantasy Grounds website store. I'm not going to load that. Um, I'm going to load an adventure. You guys, some of you are familiar with March's Adventure 1. I'll load my adventure. Uh, I do have some NPC tokens. I'll load them. I got that off the forum. Uh, my central supply catalog. I'll load that. Sometimes it takes a second. This is what I'm talking about. If they all load it automatically. Okay, there we go. It's not timing out. All right, I'm going to load my core rules. All right. I'm going to load my high guard supplement. So I got my three core rule books. My, my core rule, my high guard, and my uh, uh, central supply catalog. I don't need the player reference, so I'm not going to load that. I don't need, I'm good with just the uh, NPC module I already loaded. Um, I do have this uh, map pack, the spaceport one. I'm going to, I'll load that because I'll show you guys what that is. It's pretty neat. It's on the Fantasy Ground store. And that way you can see, uh, if you've played in any of my one shots, you'll see what that does. All right, so as a ref, what I need loaded is loaded. But the next thing I want to do is determine what my players can see. So my players will have access to what they own, which is only right. 
I like to use the uh, kitchen table analogy. So the the core rule books that you know if you if you sit at a table with your friends at a, at a you know a tabletop RPG, not everybody owns everything, but we all kind of share our books and pass them around the table sometimes. That same thing can be done on fantasy grounds. You determine what you're going to share with your players. A red X means they can't. They not only can they not see it, they can't load it, <clears throat> which is less resources that you're sharing with them. Uh, but say this generic token swapper, I don't want them to have that because that's a, that's only something I use for D and D five E. There's no functionality in that, so I'm gonna change it from green to red, and now the player load is blocked. They won't have access to this. They don't know I own it. But I think my my player should have access to my central supply catalog, so I'll let that get passed around my virtual tabletop by allowing players to to load that. Same with my core rule book. I'll let my players pass that around on my table. My high guard, and then because this is, this is good, because I, I shared my core rules, I'm going to disable this player reference because now it's just double data. Everything in here is just is a, is pulled out as a, uh, a appendix essentially to the core rules. Does this make sense? How to load and how to share uh, the books that we own or the content that we own? Or any questions? Yeah. All right. So I'm going to go ahead. You should see now in your library everything we just loaded into our session. And again, this is this is unique to each individual. Not if the players don't load any of this, then it'll still be be blank for them. So you have to walk them through this if they can't find a, a reference you're talking about. And because the stuff is loaded now, now I have items like. That, that weren't there before. Remember I showed you how stuff was empty and it can be subcategorized to the central supply catalog if they want. So it's, it's important that everybody uh, goes and loads this information that they need for their session. But as a ref, you want to have all your core rules loaded. You want to have your adventure loaded. Uh, don't ever share the adventure with the players because then they'll start flipping through it during the game and get ahead of you. Sure. They, they have to also go to the library and load each one of those books individually. Yep, anything you share with them that you want them to load, yeah. you tell them, hey, everything you could... S That's the nice thing about this module. If you if you, if you you curate it properly and there's only three things that they could, they could view... Oh, let me turn that off, right? There's only three things. You just tell them to go to the data module activation and tell them just to load everything. And then there's no question. Instead, if there was a bunch of, bunch of extra stuff in there like I was showing you and they, they load extra stuff, then it's just more data... Uh, that's getting transmitted across the network and it just slows the game down sometimes and creates confusion all right so i'm going to go ahead and close the data module activation sorry just a quick question this is probably a, maybe outside the scope of this but i've just loaded up my fantasy grounds and the background i've got is seems to be a mix of the traveler ui and of what would probably be D and D, uh, so rather than the hex kind of map background that I noticed, I even noticed last year, I've got this sort of mountainscape picture scene. Thing. Oh, you you may have selected the theme uh, like daylight or something like that. Uh, I think it was just the dark. Um, oh, dark. Yeah. Oh, is it like a campground? Um, so because because you selected a theme, it changes the whole background. Uh, oh, if, you, if you do not select a theme, it defaults to this this blue uh, hex hex pattern. Okay, well that, that that fixes that then. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, and then you can select more than one theme, but Fantasy Grounds is only going to pick one of them, and I think it goes with the top. It goes in descending order, or descending order on which one it, it chooses to load for a theme. Once you're in game, you're 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 locked with that theme until you you log back out to the launcher and change it. Good question. All right, so next up, um, now that we have these core rules, they, uh, they, are, they do act like e-readers. I will show you like the uh, core rule book. We have um, these, these contents, but I do go to the reference manual. And if you've watched me screen share any of my sessions, this is what I play out of a lot when we're doing our character creation. I am, I am constantly scrolling through all the, the careers and just throwing them out to my players like this. Boom. All right, there's your table. Now they could open it, and we could do our character creation that way. 
you know, then then my next player on their turn two says, "All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna roll uh, to join the army, and I'll do this, and then I'll set my my rolls based on this real quick." And we can come back to that when I show you uh, the dice stack. But this is what I keep open as we're doing our our character creation, and to keep it handy, I use my hot bar at the bottom. So I'm gonna close this. I do grab my reference manual, or, or anything I think I'm gonna need for my game session, and I put it in my hotbar. This is showing A7, because there are multiple. I, I use Alt for my push to talk. So I'll put it there. I'm gonna let go of my push to talk so you can see what it looks like without the A. But then there's also different combinations. You have Shift and Alt, or Control, sorry. Shift, Control, and Alt. And then combinations of them, so sh control alt, shift control alt, shift alt, and then control and shift. So there is a ton of hotbar options over. Man, what is that? Not, it's more than 48, at least 60. So that's one one thing you could use the hotbar for is dragging these, we call it the TAS symbol. TAS stands for Traveler's Aid Society. Uh, it is a organization in the Third Imperium. Uh, and it's also the the name of the program if you want to publish, self-publish content on the uh, drive through RPG under their uh, publishing program, whether it's maps or adventures or supplements. But so yeah, the TAS symbol is the the link uh, in our games, and they are like I said, they're drag and droppable, and they're also clickable, and then they nest in each other, right? And you just keep clicking into them and into them. All right, I don't normally put my adventure in my hotbar, and um, we'll cover that when we when we start going through this menu. But this is step one of two for prepping our table. All right, that's our library. Hey, Greg. Yeah. Um, for people that may not be aware as well, the uh, hotbar, uh, the numbers directly correspond to your function keys on your keyboard. Yeah, so I just hit F7 and it popped up. And so not your numbers, uh, if, you're, if you're used to doing an MMO. It is the, the F function, F7, is what I click to open that up. Thank you. All right. Uh, all right. So, library is set. Next is setting our game options. Um, what you set in here is going to be some things are universal to everybody that connects, and some things are going to be just uh, specific to you as the, the ref. Um, I'm not going to get in the weeds on, on what what you can and can't do too much because I don't play as a player, so I could only I only speak to what my players tell me they see on their end. Oh, good. I may have been fast on that. So back in the right menu, I'm going to go to Options, which is OPT. If you hover over it with your mouse, it'll show you the whole spelling. So my Options. I'm going to start with the client. Uh, when we whisper to each other, we get pinging sounds. Uh, by default, uh, we lose our, our physical characteristics or our hit dice pool in this order, endurance, strength, and dex. I know that the players can change that on their end if they want to go endurance, dex, strength, uh, or even get crazy with it um, with other, other orders. But by default, for your NPCs, Keep it endurance, strength, and dex, unless there's something else you want to play. And this will set how your players, how it loads for them. They have to manually change this on their end. All right, manual dice entry. We, I can't think of a reason why you would let your players enter their dice number unless you're, they're, you're letting them roll a physical dice on their table and you want them to enter it. Uh, so we usually keep this off. Healing characteristic order is the same as the, the damage characteristic. But you could change the order that it gets healed uh, out of order that you get wounded. It, uh, maybe you want it reverse order, dex, strength, and then endurance like that. It's totally up to you. All right, turn auto center map on. This one's kind of uh, controversial for my players. Uh, they hate it, at least my, my campaign guys. 
I love it as a ref because there could be so much going on on a map, it's hard to keep track of what token we're on, especially if I'm really zoomed in. Uh, when you hit uh, to the next player's turn in the combat tracker, we'll, we'll show the combat tracker here in a bit, uh, if it's on, it'll move the map on you. Well, the players don't like that because they don't care what, what Bill and Ted are doing, they just care about themselves, so they don't like that they're constantly bouncing around the map. But that can be turned off on their end as well. But by default, it's on. All right, set GM voice to active in the combat tracker there. This, to my knowledge, doesn't have functionality yet in Traveler. Um, if you want to speak as an NPC, I will show that real quick, though. So we'll go to NPCs. And I loaded, if you remember, those, those NPCs from um, the module activation. So we'll just get this Astrogator and old Astrogator Navy 01 Ensign. If I speak in Traveler chat in this chat window, or really fantasy runs chat, it's not specific, it's agnostic. Uh, so I'm going to come across as ref when I type hello world. All right, hello world, and there's the ref, because remember at the beginning and when we set up, this is what we're going to set the, the chat name to. But maybe, maybe we want some immersion in our game and we want the NPCs to look like they're having their conversation. All you do is you click on this little button here and you can see that Astrogator got added and is highlighted. And there's a neat trick, you could, if you're a programmer, you could appreciate it, you could hit the up arrow and then you know you get cycled through text that you've written. So now it says Astrogator, hello world. So that's pretty cool. So you could have text conversations with your players in your NPC's voice. Um, what, what this option is intended to do is in a combat tracker as it's their turn, if you turn to set, set active combat tracker, then it's supposed to talk on whoever's turn it is in that voice here. I, I haven't seen that work yet in Traveler. But worth playing with as you, as you, as you set up and see if it's ever if it's working for you. All right. Uh, controversial item. Um, players can whisper to each other in game. Uh, as a ref, you, you can see that they're, t they're typing because their portrait will have a little, uh, like a typing symbol, like a little chat bubble and dot, dot, dot in it. Uh, but you won't see what they're saying to each other because um, we have it by default set to off. If you want to see your tables whispers to each other, you just turn it on. Uh, up to you if you tell your players you're watching their chat. Maybe there's a role-playing moment, like they're in a presence of a uh, uh, something that's telepathic, and they don't know that it's telepathic, and that might be interesting to see what they're saying to each other, other than they they need to you know top off their cold beer, but that's that's what that does. How can you whisper back or whisper to a a uh, PC? Yeah, so if a player. Um, there's two ways to do it, I, and one thing is I should load a player to show you. But you, you know how you see your portrait in a game up in yeah. the sub, you see all, like all your players across the board, and you just right click on them, right. and there'll be a whisper. When I load a PC, remind me and I'll show you. Otherwise, you have these forward slash commands. Oh, got somebody connecting. So, yeah. so you see when somebody's connecting to your game, it just it slows things down for a second. And this goes back to the resources that you're sharing. Okay, so that was pretty good. By just doing forward slash, it gives you all the commands that are available for you called slash commands. I can do slash command whisper, and then the character name, and then the message. So the okay, cool. Thank you. And that's what it would look like. Uh, much easier just to do the right click though nothing will happen because he's not there but okay so that's that's how you you bring that up and do that sure thank you yep uh next up is show inventory items to clients uh, typically you keep that off where your players will see that when we start going through the party sheet uh there is an inventory tab uh as a as a ref you'll see the whole party inventory if you turn that on uh then uh that you'll uh, the players will see this window as well so if you think of a good reason why they could see that that's good on you. Okay. 
show GM roles on or off. Um, so the good way to, to visualize this is if you're using a, uh, a GM screen. If you have it off, your players will see and probably hear die rolls coming across, but they'll get the, the little eyeball with the slash and they won't know what the die result is. All right, or you can turn it on. Uh, show GM rolls on. And I got a log, that's cool. Now my players saw the uh, the six come across because it wasn't hidden, it wasn't behind the screen. If you want to do that. Can you, can you uh, dot on what you just changed? Uh, make make the circle show because I couldn't see. Mm -hmm. Show um, show GM rolls on or off. This is your ref screen. Okay, got it. I'm gonna leave. Right, it. Thank I'm, you very much. I am gonna skip two items and come back to it. Uh, if you keep it on, but you want to go back and forth between um, showing your rolls and not showing your rolls, you could enable your dice tower. Um, this little isometric box is your dice tower that just appeared. I'm gonna unlock it. I'm gonna move it near my dice stack over here. I'm going to relock it. And now if I want to make a roll, I can just drag and drop it in here that I don't want my players to see. And it'll be hidden again. They'll know you rolled something secretly, right? Yep. And now uh, fake uh, placeholder, what's a fake player, uh, he rolled in the tower. And he doesn't see his results. Only the ref could see that it was a 13. I could share it to, to fake player by dragging the die roll and just plopping it back in the chat, and now the whole table can see what he rolled. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, so to go back, uh, desktop decal image, this is the fun one. Remember we set up the decals uh, extensions at the beginning. You do get a couple that come with the core rulebook that didn't require you to enable the extension. Uh, by default, we get the smite work symbol on our background, but we can start using some of the cool traveler stuff. By just cycling through and what you see is what your players see they have no control over this yep or, or off so so whatever your flavor is and you decide like this what what uh, storm is saying here so I, I can't show it on my end because I can't whisper to myself once you enable the dice tower and you right click on it. I think at the three o'clock position, the, there's a whisper to, to GM option, and that'll initiate a conversation between you and the GM only uh, without having to use a forward slash command to do that. Oh, he said nine o'clock, so it'll be right about over here then, is where that would be on the player side. And let me do, since we're actually on that, what this is a double negative, right? So if I have my dice tower turned on, what if, I, what if I hide my rolls though? Just kind of want to show this for context. So uh, show GM rolls to off. I get this error, but uh, my dice tower dis disappeared because I don't need a dice tower if, if my, my dice rolls are hidden anyway. So if you're ever wondering where's my dice tower, make sure that your, your uh, show GM rolls is on, not off. The show GM rolls needs to be turned on in order for you to be able to see your dice tower. Correct, yep. But do, does that reveal the, the numbers? I mean, what you rolled for? Yeah, I mean, you're the, you're, you're you're the, the ref. Sometimes GM needs to show something in secret. Yeah, the, uh, everything, if, you, if you're rolling in the die tower, or you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're rolling in the die tower, they'll be secret. Only the, only the ref could see the, the result. If you have okay. if you have your show GM rolls to off, then your players won't see that as well. That's why there's no need for the dice tower. They didn't see that five. Oh, very good. Yeah, you know that because of the eyeball with the uh, slash through it. Okay, cool. Yep. All right. Next up on setting up. So it's now that we got fake in there. I am going to throw them in a combat tracker because it's good help prove uh, some concepts. You could drag a player in your combat tracker. Let me back up. That was fast. So on the menu, upper right is the CT or combat tracker. You drag and drop your players into the combat tracker by doing this number. 
Or you could just drag and drop them from the character selection in. Either work, but they're going to be one instance of that player in the combat tracker. What do you mean doing this number? Mm, that was more of a turn of phrase. Uh, the, this number I could drag and drop from character selection, but it's just going to replace fake. Oh, you can have multiple instances. I would recommend taking them from the upper left. I wouldn't use uh, out of the the PC's character selection. I would use what Hi. your players have have currently active. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna put a NPC, a couple NPCs in here real quick, just so we can show what's gonna happen as we're doing this. So, you know, astrogator and pilot. Okay. And by default, NPCs go in as hostile as bad guys. That's okay. And stretch this open. There we go. Let's do. I want to get one. Let me copy. I want me. There we go. Okay, so that makes more sense now. All right, so you got two astrogators and a pilot. So add NPC numbering appending. That means they get numbered if they're the same NPC name. They get numbered uh, in order one, two, three, etc. If you do it where it is random, the next one I lay down should just have a, a totally random number. The reason why you would want to do random is so your players don't meta you. Or so when they see a NPC token on the table, see they say see one and eight, they might think that there's going to be a two to seven somewhere. So there's at least six more NPCs. Well, that's not the case if it's random. So they start making good or bad decisions based on if they know that your your DM or their your GM referee uh, is doing a a pending. N numbering system or a random numbering system. I missed where you where you decide whether it's going to be uh, a pending or random. Yeah, right here when we're setting up at the beginning and options. Again, this is what we want to do. This is NPC number. Okay. Yeah. Step step right. two of two before you even let your players connect. You want to determine all this ahead of time. Okay. Okay. Uh, ring bell on turn. So as we pass our turn in the combat tracker, we'll start getting dinging sounds. Bing, bing. Here comes fake players. Probably just heard a ding now. Boom, boom. So, heard it. Nice. All right. So, you on or off, if you keep it off, you just kind of just call out, all right, uh, Astrogator 1, your turn. Astrogator 2, you're up. Astrogator 8, you're up. Fake player, your turn, etc. All right. So, show, show turn or order on or off. So, um, if you have it on, then all the players at your table will see this order. If it's friendly, they will only see anything in a green highlight, what their turn order is. They won't know what the NPC's turn order is. All right. Or totally off, and then nobody knows what the turn order is. It depends what your, your level of immersion you want or the scenario that you're in. We usually keep it on because uh, it, it it's, feels and plays very similar to how we do things at the uh, kitchen table. All right, we can show armor values that will allow the, the players to know what the opponent's armor value is. Uh, so we usually uh, keep that as a no because we don't want them to know how much damage reduction they're receiving. Uh, show effects on or off. Uh, there aren't that many effects in this game. Uh, that, that would be a reason, like, if, if you're in extreme gravity, it's safe to assume they're in extreme gravity, right? If they're on fire, Maybe you want to do that, but you don't want them to know that they're poisoned. So there's, I, I can't think of a reason why you would have that on in Traveler. But again, up to you. It's whatever your style of, a, of roughing you want to go with. All right, skip hidden actor. So right now, fake player cannot see any of these NPCs unless he's watching my screen. Uh, the reason being is this little little eyeball here in the yellow hex they are it is hidden so if I turn this guy on by single clicking now uh, fake player can see astrogator number one in a combat tracker and I'm going to turn on for number eight as well so one and eight are visible to fake player in this theater of the mind that we're in as I pass the turn and I say skip head, hidden actor off it's going to stop at two well what the heck players are like well now I know there's at least a hidden NPC out there because it did this this little widget did not go to the next player. I'm gonna reset that. I'm gonna put it back at the top. 
I'm going to turn on skip hidden actor to on. Now it should go from 1 to 8 because it's going to skip hidden actor number 2. I would I would probably encourage turning that on. I don't that's one of the few default ones I disagree with. The turn on skip hidden actor. Yeah, so that way if you have a somebody say like a sniper that's on your combat tracker and the players yeah. aren't aware that he's there. Uh, but if you pass a turn and it and it stops on on something they can't see, they know there's somebody out there. You just you just triggered your player spidey senses. Can the hidden actor still act? Yeah, he could definitely still act, right? So, say it's hidden actor, right? I could open up his actions. Sorry, fake. I'm gonna smoke you. Okay. I could target him, so I, now I have him targeted. We're gonna go over the combat tracker later. Just, just want to show you. Very good. Well, I did not target him, so let me just. There we go. Okay, now I got him targeted, and a laser pistol, a sniper on. Oh shoot! That's the damage. I meant to hit roll to attack. Anyway, that's that's how you do it. Um, we're gonna do a combat tracker at the end on how this functions, but I just wanted to show you that you could still function with a hidden actor as a as a ref. Roger. Okay. And that's all we need this combat tracker now for this part. All right, we want to stop the round uh, at the top where the, where you have to initiate the next round as a ref, on or off. By default, it's off. I think that's that should be good. Uh, view health ally uh, detailed. Uh, it shows them if they're not doing it. It's, it gives you a very specific word if they're doing good or not. Uh, or the status, which is more vague. But detailed uh, is, is where you want to be. And then health non-ally. You just want to know the status. Are they wounded? Are they gravely wounded? Uh, you don't want them to know... Uh, the details of how close they are to death. So status is, is, is the good default one. Next up, uh, we really don't play with the tokens. These are by default are pretty good unless you want to turn on a facing indicator which puts a little dial that spins around the portrait so you know which way the player's facing. That's up to you if you want to turn that on or off. Uh, it's very hard to see unless you're zoomed way in. But uh, party vision and movement just implies if 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 fake went to a around a corner and the token could see because of line of sight, uh, does that mean watch case can see what fake saw on a on our on our tabletop? We would uh, that's that's how it would work because we can't on our chess X battle map or on our our dwarven forge uh, you know nice terrain battle maps. Once you start revealing for one player, the whole table could see. But in fantasy grounds, you can make it so. Just, just the player can see what they see. So we keep that off, so that way there's no party vision. And then we got house rules. A lot of heavy weapons over, our th uh, yeah, 100 kilograms. Up to you. Show study period. Highly encourage turning this on. So I'm going to use you as an example fake, and we're going to see if we pop any errors. But So uh, in Traveler, we don't gain levels. We, uh, we, we use our downtime while we're in hyperspace or, or on a uh, you know a yacht or an X-boat going out to the stars uh, to get to the the, per the the library on the ship and we start training in our, what we want to increase the skill in. So if you go to your skills tab, uh, he's only got gun combat and nothing else. Let's say he wants to start training towards a vac suit. Uh, there's nothing for him to annotate that in. So I turn this on. And now the study period is available, and you can set it to vac suit. Right, and it takes uh, one study period for him to get it from zero to one. So we can type that in. And we just did a two parsec jump, so that's he's on week two. And it takes eight weeks for a single study period. Right, and that's how we could track this. And then at the end of the eight weeks, go ahead, fake, and give me your education check. I'm going to set it. I don't know if you know how to do that, but education, you can double click on the mod. I'm just kind of, we're just playing around now. But that's one of the rules in, fan, it's, or in uh, Traveler is even at the end of your study period, you still have to pass your education. Nope. Waste of eight weeks, you didn't, you didn't gain a vac suit. Sorry, fake. Unless there, unless there was a nice, unless there was a nice computer a library computer, then maybe you get a plus one. Well, that is a thing. So you're right there. Maybe you did. 
But anyway, so that's that. And then the next thing is if you're using the optional psionics rule, then you would turn this on, and it just added that characteristic right here. All right, so uh, if you're not using psionics, just keep that off. Highly encouraged to keep your study period on at all times. Another one, I guess, uh, unless, unless you guys are doing a one-shot, then there's no need for it. What is, uh, uh, under show name, what does it mean, tool tip? Yeah, I, I skipped that. Let me bring up my note on it, because I don't know off the top of my head, but I do have the curriculum for Okay, me. I'm sorry. Yeah, one second. I'll see if I get you a quick answer. Yeah, so even in my curriculum, it doesn't tell me what that is. I skip it because uh, I've never figured out what it's done in my games, and it's not part of the DM 101 curriculum. We, we gloss over that. I believe what it is is when you hover over a token on the map, it will pop up the character name as a tooltip, but it's not always there. Ah, that makes sense. There you go. Yep. Thanks, saying it too. So there you go. So, um, yeah, when we get a battle map open. I, I didn't hear. I'm sorry. One of my kids was just talking. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I can repeat it because I understand it. So what we're saying is um, I'm going to turn it on, and when we get to a battle map, I'll show you. Uh, but show, where is that? That was under tokens, right? Uh, that you just had it. scroll down. There it is. Yeah, tooltip. Show name. Yeah, so what yeah. we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll cover over a token on a battle map with our mouse, and it's because this is a tooltip, it'll show that information of the token the token name. So, oh, okay, very good. All right, so, so we'll just leave it, and I'll show you that because I, I think I understand that. Yeah, same thing with the, uh, you know, it's usually under here. If what you're saying, the status effects, um, I guess I never thought about it. So in, in sorry, guys, in 5e, there is a, uh, we call it uh, green to red or green to dead. Uh, if there is a tooltip on the token for the status, uh, yeah, there is, yeah, exactly. Fake. It's, it's there for yeah. 5e. I, I didn't realize it wasn't here for here. But, yeah, it, uh, it'll it show you uh, green as they're, they're healthy. Then it'll transition to yellow when they're mildly wounded red when they're close to dying and then uh you know there's no no it's like a white space and i'll show that they're dead uh, but it's not an option here in traveler so <laughs> all right next up sorry and that was our options any any questions any questions in here while we're here you, it does. We can play with the currencies. Uh, it, by default, it's CR. Uh, case sensitive, it does matter. Um, I don't have a question, but I do have a, just a comment that if uh, you discover that there's a particular you know, feature that you want, I've, I've learned that the, uh, the Mad Beard Man is like the main coder, and he's very responsive to requests from the, uh, the gamer community. So if you decide you want to transition that element, you know, the, the colored coding over to Traveler and enough people mention it, um, it, it's possible that they would pass it out in a, in a future update. Yep, I agree 100%. Yeah, if you see a feature that you like from another rule system, definitely recommend it to Mad Beer Man and mention that system so he knows because he has access to everything. All right, so now that our options are, are configured and our library is loaded, this is the opportune time now to say, all right, players, go ahead and connect to my table. That way, as you start playing, you don't go through and start doing stuff on the fly. You, there's more fluid. You can start your adventure as, as the time comes up and it's ready to play. You don't have to go through and make adjustments. Uh, and again, these will your options in your library will stay the same in your campaign data when you close it. Uh, as long as you don't create a new, new campaign every game, uh, it'll stay how you have it. And nothing says you can't change it on the fly. It's just you don't have to make all those changes on the fly at once. So that's that's my rule of thumb is get your options and your library set before you have your players connect. All right, so we're going to start covering um, some of the, the uh, uh, buttons now. So we have familiarization. I, I do want to... I know my mouse is hovering over there. We're gonna we're gonna skip this real quick because for functionality, I do gotta talk about our dice stack in the bottom left. 
Um, I could clear this astrogator by right clicking and hitting the little remove erase. So we're back just to the referee. All right, so starting with this dice stack in the bottom left, we have a modifier. Um, you can manually type in, so you can see I typed and it says it's adjusting. I could type in a value. All right, I could do it and type it, I can make it a negative value. Oh, negative, whoo, back up. There we go, negative four. Um, or we, I could clear that. Or I could just use this dice stack here. They they will set my up to a plus three. But, yep, there we go. Fake is going on. He's got it. Or negative. All right, once you roll, do, once you roll, it'll, it'll adjust clear. Just the modifier yeah, to but, make it a negative. Yeah, so type. Uh, so first, if you have your thing open, you just single click in with your mouse. And then yeah. I use my number pad on my keyboard. I hit minus. Yeah, oh, I got okay. Yep. Right. Okay, I'm sorry. We could try something. Um, this this works in some areas. You could hold down Control and spin your mouse wheel over it. Let's see. So that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to use my mouse, and it, it yeah. wasn't working. That that does work in some rule sets in some locations. It does not work there, though. Yeah. Okay. Hey, hey G Rex. Yeah. Um, I just noticed that the the plus one, two, three, and minus one, two, three, uh, those are cumulative. So they if are. you have multiples, yes. That's what I was, I was, yeah, that's what I was doing that real quick. I, I went back to it. Yeah, so you could you could play with this to get uh, a negative, I guess. So you always do the three. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Yeah, you get all the way yeah. through six. Yeah, there's combinations for all of it. I can't think of a reason why I would go off that, that chart of neg negative or uh, a, a positive six to minus six. That's a pretty big swing for Traveler. I thought a boon or a a, a, a bane was the addition of a, of a whole extra dice, not just a, a bonus of one or two. Yeah, so there should be maybe a bigger space between boon and bane in these modifiers. It's just logically boon's on top uh, because uh, I had to, I'm going to take advantage of your, your, your character sheet here, Fake. Um, I got the boon set. And it's gonna roll three die and drop the lowest, and it it knows to drop. It'll tell you. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, but yeah, they it it's it's with the mod the, the bonus modifiers at the top because that's a good thing, and then bane is the opposite. Three d six and drop the highest roll. Oh. Yep. Uh, well, I guess I'll, I'll keep using fakes because we're gonna go to the stack. If you want to do a skill roll, uh, gun combat we usually say is dexterity, so you can cycle through, make the player will make the roll. But you could force it. Say there's some situation where you want to override the dex and make it a strength. Now, when he makes that roll, it should override that dex. Right? See, override strength. So that's what these tools are used for, right here, to override whatever whatever is going to be coming through by default. Okay. Cool. Next up is our task difficulty. Um, so everything in Traveler is based on a 2D uh, by default, unless unless it says otherwise, 2D being 2D6. Uh, so your your average roll is a seven, and then six to eight is our, our routine and average range. Um, so I could click on routine, I could click on average, and starting at simple is two, easy is four, and I could just kind of click. We, we don't really use odd numbers in Traveler. It's up to the ref uh, to set a odd number if they want, or an even number, but they could click in here and I can make it a seven if I, if I want it to be perfectly average. Now, what's crazy to me about this is that the players have uh, agency in it. So, Fake, go ahead and set that to difficult. See, I, see the ref didn't do that. Now my players just took, took control away from me as the ref. So uh, at my tables, I ask my players not to touch that. Uh, but if you're at a table where the players are very good with the rules and know, they know what their skill check difficulty rating should be, then that's why that's open. Because uh, some things are, are like a, a faster than light jump is always a four, so the players could could just set four because they know it's coming. Uh, not that I know of. I don't know if there's a form thread to change that. And, and like I was just describing, maybe Mad Beard Man plays at a table where his players know the rules well enough where they, he lets them just set their task difficulty. And just moderates the result, but I, I do wish it was an option where I could turn that on and off. So that could be a good recommendation. So, any, any questions about the dice stack? 
I am understanding everything so far. Yep. Okay, so now we're gonna go back and start doing these these button descriptions. This is this area now that we know the options are set up and how our dice work. This is the meat and potatoes of refing a game session. Now we are going into game session mode. Uh, first thing we have is a new feature is our space combat tracker. Um, I'm not going to cover this because it's not working yet. I mean, it is available, and you, you could do workarounds, but for now, I'm just going to skip it. Uh, combat tracker, this is fully functional. We've already started to see how we got uh, the stuff loaded. Uh, we're going to play around in this a little bit now, but then I'm going to load a, uh, like we're in, in an adventure, is how we're going to spend our last 10 minutes of this session. All right, but you can delete individual actors out of here by right-clicking and delete item. Uh, I could delete all NPCs by clicking on this menu here and delete from tracker all non-friendly. All right. Um, we could reset the turn order or just pass the round as the next round. But we reset it by highlighting and going back to one if we want. And uh, we'll get we'll get more of the, the nitty gritty uh, once we actually do our mock encounter here at the end. But that's, that's where our combat tracker is located. Next up is the party sheet. So I still got to put fake in. So just like I was showing you on the combat tracker, I would drag and drop the portrait out of uh, my uh, portrait stack in the left, upper left. Yes, yeah, I'll, yeah I, I'm the same way. I'll cover that. You can make your players pass their own turn. Some players will sit there and wait for you like you're a mind reader, or some will, will tell you, well, I'm done and they expect you to pass it, but yeah, training your players to pass their turn. I'll, I'll show you guys. Is it inside the party sheet where you have to reset their abilities uh, on their character sheet, or they, do they do it themselves? Uh, so that is, so that's a glitch, right? We were just talking about that in our last session, last game. So um, that's in, the, that's in the, player, the player sheet. They have to go to their, was it the actions tab is where we found that, and they have to reset everything to max when that's glitched out like that because like sometimes okay. you'll see the currents like 16 but they could only be seven max so you have to go through and start refreshing everything at the beginning of a session just to make sure everything's straight or if they get if they you know they get their medical treatment and they're fully healed then you can go through and update their uh, physical characteristics that way um, you can manipulate in the combat tracker but i wanted to show that when we actually have the encounter but this is just more, this main tab is just a quick glance for you as a ref. Uh, so you just kind of see what your players are at, armor rating. Uh, right now he's not wearing anything, so he doesn't reduce any damage that's coming in. And it would tell you, um, you know, if it's kinetic laser, stuff like that. So this is a nice quick glance. I don't play with this open because uh, I don't use usually use this. I'm, I'm fast enough to just go into party sheets and look, but it's up to your preference. And your, your Why does he have two different dexterity numbers? Aha. Uh -huh. So? Jihad. Let's go back. And he he did he's been changing this. Oh, okay. But yeah, so uh we it, it, it's off the charts right now. Okay, somebody's just playing around. Yeah. So but don't yeah, don't get hung up on that. It'll, and you can force roll for him by clicking in there. That they want AFK, right? You know. Or oh yeah. You had to go run out and get a pack of smokes. I've I've had a guy disappear on me for thirty minutes once. I can play. <laughs> I, I can play. I can play form right on here. Instead of the character sheet, however, you, whatever your again, whatever your style is. Uh, what I do use this for though is the inventory. Um, when when you award uh, loot like on an encounter, you wouldn't just drag and as a ref, you wouldn't drag and drop it to the player sheets form. What you would do is you would pull it all together here in the parcel or the inventory and the, the, the currency, and then the players could manage what they're getting out of here. And I'll, I'll again, we'll have an example at the end because we're gonna have the encounter. We're gonna, we're gonna win the encounter, and then the players are gonna have access to all the gear that was in that room along with the credits that they swiped. So I'll, I'll show that. I just wanna show you this is where it's at. And order, uh, it's very, it's, it's a, uh, it's not specific to anything. This could be a marching order or a sleeping order or a overwatch order taking turns in a, in a sniper position. However you want to use this, but as a ref, you just update it by clicking in here and putting a number in so we know what order they are. Is that red uh, slash there or white slash in the red 
hexagon you use that to change it from a watch order to whatever title you want no you remove just simply just removes people out of that order oh i see okay so if they're not part of that no i'm not going to take part of the watch then you just delete them out of there like that okay i understand i thought you meant to change the name yeah that do, that does drop them then from the party sheet but I'll put you back in all right, so that's that's our party sheet and the basic stuff in there. Next is the calendar. If you recall, I did load the Fantasy Grounds calendar, so now we have access to all these cool little calendars. It's it has a bunch of systems: Ravenloft, Dark Sun from D and D, Pathfinder, Galorian calendar, Gregorian calendar for playing in a modern current day setting. Uh, but we do have the Third Imperium Traveler calendar. Sorry, it was a double click. And man, the Golden Age of Man, I think, is like 2105. I forget what year is that. Or 1305? I think it's the 13th. I know it's an 05, yeah. All right, and then we have this. It's it's a Julian Day calendar, 365, 1 to 365. But, all right, and this, you could just add log entries, right, on this day. So. Star date 1305 007, right, etc. And then these are things that you could take. I could share that note in chat. My players could grab that. Uh, and if you've played in a game, we'll leave that in there and we'll grab that here in a little bit and we'll put that in our notes. All right. Well, let me make a let me make a log entry. Keep, like, keep wanting to call you a flake player. Fake player. All right. <coughs> All right. So that's there. We'll, we'll come back to that. All right. So that's our calendar. Uh, next up is the colors. Uh, this is our dice bag because we can't fire dice for, for coming up snake eyes all the time. The, the best thing we do is just change the color of the die. And you can see right here it's changed. Uh, the point is that now that you're in your fake, yep. So you can see fake is he's got this little red dot. Go, yep, now he's changing his color palette. I don't know if that's coming through on the resolution. But you could see the, the die it color. Is. Yeah, you, that's how you connect your players. That's also the color of the arrows that are drawn for them or the shapes of the uh, circles or squares on a map is based on their die Does color. Does the ref have control over that for the players or do the players have total autonomy? Yep, total, total player agency on that. The ref can't control it. I do, you see me a lot, uh, with a good contrast in here is a yellow uh, for me. Uh, it's just the way I, I do highlights and stuff. Did you spin the uh, wheel to get it slightly changed? No, I'm so I'm, I'm, I'm multi-clicking on the color palette. I'm not spinning. Just click, 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 click. Oh, okay. And then you could change the die. So now it's have a white text. It's a black text in there. So you get the contrast. See, so he's got black on black. Technically, you don't need to see the die because it tells you what it is. No, no white on black. So there we go. All right, so that's our colors, our modifiers. So uh, this is kind of nice. You don't have to use this if you know the rules well enough. You just make a single in your dice stack. You can make a, uh, uh, a bonus, but I can select uh, these extra bonuses, right? And then they will apply to my die roll when I make an attack roll. That's the same thing. And these will it'll auto calculate. So I'm gonna go ahead and we'll use his action with that stack I just made, plus one, plus one, plus one, minus three. So this should zero it out. We'll see. Actions, auto pistol, let's attack. All right, you can see all those bonuses being applied. And it ended up being a, a plus minus zero, so there was no thing here, so it's straight 12. I could get, I could just do a plus one and a minus two though, and then you can see it should give me a minus one. What's the difference between using that box, the modifiers box, rather than the dice stack? Uh, there is technically there's no difference mechanically. It's just this this gives you the rule. Like I know 
I'm taking a minor action oh, aim and the laser. I don't have to go. All right, minor action. I'm 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 aiming. My my weapon has a laser yeah, sight. It, it so, cleared up the the resolution. I couldn't read the actual letters. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm good now. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Oh. Oh, sorry. Yeah, fake can see what he's doing. Here's your. That was your first shot. Uh, this one's all right. <laughs> Cracking. All right. I just couldn't read the other thing. I'm sorry. Yep. No worries. Yeah. So this is this is more it gives you more of the rules. Uh, but if your players know the rules, they don't need this. They could just use their dice stack down here and just calculate in their head. It's just this is a feature that's there for you, and you can actually make your own. If there's a custom rule you have you want to use. And the effects, we kind of showed this before, but there's 10 effects that are programmed in the game, and you could just apply these in the combat tracker. I would just do a drag and drop on the fake, and now he's unconscious because I dragged unconscious. All right, he's got the unconscious effect. I can, I can revive him by going to the. Uh, oh, that's his armor. There, there is a little flag, the effects. I can just delete that effect off of him. Any questions about this, the little button uh, grouping up here before I keep moving on? And then any, we've been, we're over halfway, anybody need a break? Is this uh, staring at the screen, you gotta look away for a couple minutes? Anybody wanna take a three minute break? Otherwise we'll keep pushing. It's on. So, sorry, was yeah. that good? Keep going. Yeah, press on. Press, okay. All good. Okay, so now we're going to start getting to these, these buttons down, the bigger ones. Uh, before I go through them, I do want to show you a kind of a little bit of a backtrack, but we're going to go back to the library down here. By default, this is a GM uh, Game Master setup. Uh, that is this button right here. Uh, at players, by default, will look like this, and I could click it. That's what players usually have when they log in by default. Uh, if we want, if we want to update it to a create PC, these are the only four things you need as a player to create a pl uh, player character. I can click on all, and it gives me everything. Uh, based on your monitor and the resolution, uh, this might break into two columns. I'd say okay. You can't control how it does it. It is what it is. Uh, or you could customize it by single clicking. Like I don't need the psi abilities. I don't need in my game anymore. I don't need a, the races. I don't want to play with a home world, etc. And I could just, you know, I don't need this extra stuff, but I, I need more than a GM, but I need less than all. That's totally up to you how you set this up. But I'm going to put it on all because we're going to go through all of them. Okay, so starting with PCs. So when um, when Fake, he, he either created this character on the fly, I think I was watching him do that, um, or, or he could import it in. But by default, this is blank the first time you connect. Now you or your players, um, if you had a character creation session, but you had a different campaign data folder, you called it character creation. Nice. You can uh, import characters from that from any other session that is on your computer still stored as a module file. Let me back up. I, uh, it went too fast. That is on this yeah. little blue <laughs> import characters, right? Blue up arrow. You import that character if they've ever been on your table. This also applies to your players. They could do this as well. And then you, you find that where we're going to find watch case. Man, I got a lot. Been a busy month. <laughs> Here's watch case. All right, so I'm going to load watch case. So you can see in the chat, the pre generated character was added. I'm gonna go back to the character selection and now watch case is available. Currently not owned by anybody. Um, Sternbach, if, if this was Mr. The Yellow and Fake and he says, oh, I, I just wanna play with Fake Player, I could clear the owner by right clicking. Clear owner. Now the other players could come in and grab Mr. The Yellow. You can go ahead and grab him back. Uh, that was it. All right, um, yeah, that's how we do that. Um, 
if you have a file, this was a good one. So you may have been at my table the other day at a character creation where we had uh, Alex. She asked that I give her her HTML file because she wants to transfer it to a different computer. You will go to import character. This is if a player provides you an HTML file of their character. Import character. We're going to hit the, the import character file. So you hit the, the blue button a second time, blue up arrow. And I'm pretty sure there she is. There's Alex. Now this you can see where it was loaded off off my documents, and she will be here. The pro the one problem I guess it's not really a problem is uh, portraits don't transfer this way. So she will have to select her portrait again. All right, and you're the ref. You could see all the player sheets. Uh, whether who doesn't matter who owns them, I could go through all of them and skim and start reading. Go to this, and I'll know uh, what's going on with Mr. The Yellow, etc. So full full control on uh, what you see on your player character sheets for at your table. All right, so those are my PCs. Uh, notes. So notes is kind of unique. We don't have to do pen and paper while playing a game as a referee. I like to maintain uh, 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 places of interest and uh, NPCs, so I'll call. All right, uh, I can start making a list of NPCs that we have. What was that guy's name? Mr. Not Dossier. Courier. Anyway, the guy from the scout services, and I could start, and I could link. I could actually take the NPC out of a, out of an adventure, right? And I could just link it if they have a, if they have a thing like that, right? And now I have a quick reference for that. I'll also maintain, like I said, a set of locations of interest. Right, and then I could start. I could start building on that too, so I don't forget and I have a quick reference. That way, I don't have to go back through the adventure and flip through to find that stuff. When I first started trying to build a campaign, I used notes, thinking it would just be the notes, and I screwed everything up. Oh yeah, that's, that's right. yeah. Notes is not, that's not what that's for. That's that is literally just a think of it as your legal pad. Yeah, I, I later on I learned about using the the story. Um, but I, yeah, I tried notes that didn't work. Yep. Now, what's cool about them? We could use Sternbach as an example. You could see your players' notes and who owns it. Let's see. Did you write anything? Don't read this out loud. All right. Uh, <laughs> uh, shoot, I already read it. So Sternbach, go ahead. And I shared that TAS symbol of the calendar, TAS thirteen oh five dash zero zero seven. Go ahead and drag and drop that to your notes. So because it's not listed as public, that means only Stormbach can see his notes. Yeah, and the ref, but yeah. Oh, and the ref, okay. There you go. Uh, hit hit enter again, and then um, I, I know it'll say a little blank TAS. So you can right-click in there and then go to, what is the main body text or something like that? Let me see. It'll be paragraph type, and it'll be, uh, yeah, body text right around the one o'clock position when you start a new line. Because I want you to do something for me real quick. You can now drag and drop, uh, say say the ref, uh, I'll give you, this is important information you need. Go ahead and grab that there. So you can see he just dragged and dropped my chat and it, and, and it went there. He didn't have to type it out again. There you go. So, and then if he makes it public, then the whole table will have access to it. So if you have somebody that's a good note taker and they, uh, you know, that that is maybe their profession, they're a journalist, right? And they, they want to use the notes as, as their own personal uh, uh, I don't know, magazine or log, yeah, you know, publication, then they could, they could use it that way. Correct, you, other players can't edit other players' notes even if they're public, they're only viewable. Oh, okay. 
But now you can see this public. I know that the entire table could read this note because it has the little P. So that's the notes. Don't want to get stuck on there too long. Images is images and maps. Uh, this is the, where the data is stored in the in the game for the adventure under this. So if I ever need to go to a map real quick and find it, I get sorted by the adventure, the high and dry. And we know I need to go and share Central Lake with my players. There is the image and map. So this should be familiar to some of you. Uh, two ways to share this with the players. This is I have it open. Doesn't mean my players could see it. You could grab the TAS button and share that in game, and then they could open that. Or you right click and go to this nine o'clock position of sharing, and you share the record, and then you can see the players that are viewing this. Uh, they'll get a little portrait icon down there. Oh. So I know who's who's looking at this. So I know who's asleep at the wheel. <laughs> Fake. Fake gamer. Uh, you know, I may only see this once because um, he's he's the same character for both, so it may only give me one portrait. Was it, was it, are you saying it came up when I shared the TAS symbol in chat, or or is it was it, I think it was timing. I went pretty quick. No, out. when you when you right click and share from the TS yeah. button. Yeah. Yeah. That's when it automatically comes up. If you just throw it into the chat box, it does not automatically come up. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Sorry if I didn't articulate that. If you want to force share and know that your players are viewing something, you right click on the image or the map and you go to sharing and share record. That is transmitting through the cloud back down to their computers that image to their screen. Uh, could be some lag on that, but it, that is how it works. Uh, and to speak on that, so that's images and maps. So let's look. Oop. We also look at. So we do get stuff uh, kind of um, grouped together by map. That's really nice. Pretty much everything else is a image. So there's the eruption. All right, I have this image. I could share it with my players, etc. I'm not gonna do that. So I'm just not uh, sending too much data over. But that's that's how you do that. Um, so, yeah, but that's if there's a TAS symbol, it could be nested somewhere else, and I'll show you that. So remember, Tensure Tensure's Wolf. I won't open it, but I'll we'll remember that. Next up are tables. Uh, I don't think I I loaded uh, the D66 compendium, but so Mongoose Traveler has tons of tables, right, for character creation. So the agent law enforcement. Right, these are the, the the things I was sharing in chat for you to roll and hit the little blue button on, and it automates. They don't have to do anything. It's it's one of the super cool features with Fantasy Grounds is the tables, and they come with the rules and what you buy, so it's really nice. Uh, but there's more more than just character creation. Uh, we do have, um, mm, let's see, there are uh, space events. So let me type. You get search for it if you think you know what it is. All right, yeah, space encounters. So you can bring up a space encounter table, and every time a, a uh, your your travelers jump into a new new star system, you can roll on this if you want. Now, if you roll on that, the, the players will see it right away. But what if you're trying to not let them see it, like putting a I guess a dice tower or something, so that they don't see your yeah. So they, they didn't see that because I, I am playing with my dice rolls off. But to show you that, because uh, uh. what you're asking is a good is a good question because you can't just click on that button. It won't work that way. So you do. Um, where are my options? LPT. It's got to set this real quick. Show GM rolls to on, and then yeah, I'm gonna get that error. And then I want to turn on my dice towers on. Okay, cool. So I would if I like you're saying if I just roll it, they'll see this now. Right, they see that there is a police ship, you know, sitting outside Highport. But I could, right. I'm grabbing and I'm dragging and dropping to the dice tower, and I'll roll on a table. Uh, okay. And they just hit, they collided with something meteorite, <laughs> micro meteorite. Okay. Something. And so if you knew, like, they had a, a vulnerable ship from the, the, taking damage before, as a DM, then you can override that because you see what was about to happen, and then you can say nothing happened. Yeah. Exactly. Or one of those like backup, yeah. Or you know, it gives me it gives me a second. Like, all right, I roll this, then I was tense, and then I say, okay, about 
uh, you know, 500 kilometers off your starboard is a, a ship floating dead in space. Well, do they want to redirect and go to it? They don't know that it's derelict. I know it's derelict, possible salvage, right. but they don't know that, and, and they have that conversation. So when you did that, you grabbed the the, the blue thing, yep. and did you just roll it right there amongst the hexes, or did you? Were, oh, you dropped oh, it in I'm, the dry I'm, I'm dropping. I'm releasing my. Uh, I'm currently holding my mouse left mouse button. As soon as I release it over the okay. dice tower, that's okay. what happens. Yep. Okay, and it stays hidden. Yep. And then, for, and then for this, I would do like, okay, all right. My player's anxiety is building. I got a three, so there's an explorer in space, and then I just build it up however I want to do it. Just, just, it requires some improv, but just play around with it. Okay, cool. So those are my tables, and they're, 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 there's a lot. We could spend, I could spend classes on the tables in Fantasy Grounds, or in um, Mongoose Traveling. We're going to move on, because this is, this is the big one, this story. So story is kind of our bread and butter. So uh, High and Dry Adventure starts at chapter three for for, for me. I know this because I've run this four times already this month. <clears throat> and what I do is um, I'm going to start building how, how I, I do my adventure. So I like it kind of wider. I'll be right around there probably. And you could turn this just like a page in a book, right? And I don't need this anymore because I'm not going to keep clicking each of those individually. I'm just going to go through this. So the traveler, the travelers are offered middle passage to Walston, thousand apiece. Uh, let me go back. I went too far then. All right, all right. So the travelers are meeting with Mr. Anders Kasiri of the Imperial Scout Services in the office in Highport. Um, I'll show you now. There is no map for the service in Highport. If there was, it would be linked here at the bottom. Remember in the beginning I was telling you guys I loaded the starport in my library, or spaceport meanders pack? I think I, yeah. I I spent up to $10 on this. And it's a really cool images and map pack. And I every every session I had, I just picked somewhere new. Uh, over Let's see what this one was. Uh, I wanted to use that. I, that's too small of an office. What's it called? Uh, it is called the uh, Spaceport FG Meanders Map Pack. Let's see, offices. Uh, I know one of you guys, well, at least one of you guys were in here once. All right, and this is what I was using. This is kind of it's easy to load and it looks great in Fantasy Grounds. My players play a lot in the casino on my bi weekly for some reason, but. So a bunch of cool little maps in there. But that's, if, if it's not linked, sorry, that's what. Just want to be quick on it. If it's not linked and you need a, an, an asset, uh, you can bring stuff from outside the game that didn't come with the map uh, from either from purchase on Fantasy Grounds or you could take GM 102 and I can show you how to bring in your own personal maps into a game. All right, so like I said, we're just going to kind of play. This is how I play through it. I'll have my combat tracker open, uh, usually down here. Kind of As you scroll into the story, do the players see like right now basic offer, or is that like did you force that to their desktop, or do you have to drag that text, drop it over in the chat? If 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 I want my players to see the story item, uh, I can right click it and share it, or like we do, we could drag and drop it. However, be very careful sharing the story because that is the adventure book. This is literally this story is this uh, March's adventure high and dry. So you, you're gonna give them insight at what uh, rough notes that they may not need or you don't want them to have. Oh, I see. Now, sometimes, so that's just uh, for uh, you as the ref to be scrolling through and, and keeping yourself on track as to where there's yeah, if it's a, a story. Going. Especially in a linear story like we've been playing with Traveler. In a um, okay. in a more of a sandbox, I would, I'd actually play it on a map and I'll show you why in a little bit. But so the basic offer, but then you know, we just start going through players accept the offer, right? We go in route. I have the the autumn gold, which is the far trader that the players get get to jump passage on, they make it from Flammarion to Walston. All that information is in here. It requires you can't just read this the first time, the first time you read this can't be when you're playing, you should, right? Because there's a lot of little text, but it just keeps it in a logical order for you to do this. We have the map. Of uh, this, this chunks of the adventure that I skipped out to keep us 
tried to keep us at four hours, but less than five hours. So we didn't go to these other planets on a port call. But isn't this got the notes on that passive racism with the Varger? So see, this is embedded. Now we get to Walston on the story, chapter four, and I have the map of the Star Town, and this is how I kind of I do things. It's a little too high. There we go. I resize things to, to maximize my screen space because you all already know if you've played in, in uh, Fantasy Grounds that windows uh, take up a lot of real estate in a, in a single panel. So then I'll share this by right clicking with my players. All right? I tell them they're here on this landing pad. I can draw by right clicking and going to pointers and I could do like a circle and say this is this is where the autumn gold just landed, right? If I want, I can clear that. Uh, there is a quick, uh, and I'm sorry if you're not in doing this, you could, you can draw real quick by holding your left and right mouse button. And if you do shift left and right mouse button and drag your mouse, you get a square. You, you do it by holding control and you'll get a circle. Or if you do the alt button, it'll draw a cone. And then if you don't do any of the buttons, just your left and right mouse button, I could this I use a lot, I'll do arrows. Like, alright, so you guys are gonna be coming coming to building one there. Right, and I just draw the arrow on the screen and they see it. That's holding left and right simultaneously and just drawing it. Yep, I'm just dragging. No other buttons, that's your arrow. Oh. <clears throat> and to clear it is just a quick left and right mouse button click and it'll clear it. Are the arrows always defaulted yellow? Nope, matches my dice. Oh. Ah, so okay, go cool. here, here, watch this. So go ahead. I'm going to share this. Uh, go ahead, Jose. There, yeah, there you go. So he's his his die is black, and you can see I can see players drawing on it. There you go. Cool. Yeah. So. Yep, he's changing his color. Awesome. All right, so that's now play in a linear fashion on, and travel, just going through and clicking through, uh, get information on the town. Etc. What actually happened? We know what actually happened to the high and dry crew. Uh, they were at, they were jerks, All right? Then you you get them to get on the to push them along. You kind of railroad them, I guess, on this adventure. It doesn't have to be that way, but this is just how this example is. You get them to finally convince them to go to Central Lake. They get to Central Lake. You know, I'll tell my players, all right, I'm getting I'm leaving the Star Town map. You don't need that anymore. All right, and we get to Central Lake map. All right, and then they get here and they go to the governor's palace and they eat their, their fish and seaweed. All right, and we just keep going. All right, now the players are going to go to the Mount Salabari. All right, we're going to get them on a hover car to get up there or an ATV or whatever the mechanism is to get them up there. I'll share this with my players. All right, and we just, this, I'm just playing the adventure and reading the notes, and we're interacting with the map, and I'm sharing it with my players, and we're talking and sandboxing and role playing. You know, this is it. What do you mean sandboxing? I uh, sandbox is if we're in that town, right? Here, here's a good example. All right, so the only thing I have notes on is building two. It's the governor's palace by that some guy named Dictator Schmuckatelli. I forget his name. Well, say the players want to spend two days in here, and they they want they they don't like the way the Varger are being treated, and they want to uh, you know uh, right some wrongs, or or I plant a uh, an NPC in here if I wanted to. Remember, in character creation, we have uh, allies and uh, yeah. right. I could seed a. Yeah. I could see what I'm trying to think of the term. I could seed a enemy or a rival in here, already in, in our in our adventure. And sandbox is, to me just means we just kind of go off the script. Okay. Right, because we're not. I don't like to railroad. Uh, my players when we did this adventure was two four hour sessions. You know when we, you and I played it, it was a single four hour session. Yeah. So just whatever your style is as a DM or a referee. Yeah, we're all going to have some. Some of you may never even use any of the purchase material, and I, I get it. And then some of you, if you're like me, you don't have time to do a, uh, a, a homebrew, but you. But I like to. I like to have some, uh, you know, good role playing outside of the plot line. I'll, I, I'll just add to the uh, purchase adventures. But again, totally up to your style. All right, 
and we're just going linear again so I share this we could kind of show where they're going from well I guess Central Lake is over here and then they'll be coming up here all right and this is it and this is uh, just clicking through map Mount Salabari climbing the mountain if the the players didn't have uh, breathing apparatuses and you got a every every 900 meters you start getting these breathing conditions all right and it spells it out and we're gonna get to the crater now we got a new map. This is this is where I want to show you guys. So this is cool. So you can see there's red pins on this map. These pins directly correlate with the story. So this, if I hover over it, it's 7.01, the lava tubes. That's next here on the map. But say my players don't go to 7.01. Let me put, um, let me go to the combat tracker. And Flake is gone, so I'll put Mr. The Yellow in. I'll just put Mr. This is very rough because like, there's no hexes. But say Mr. Yellow doesn't go right to 7.1. He's going to go to right here to 2. Let's go ahead and move your 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 hex for me, Mr. The Yellow. Try to I don't have that map. Oh, oh, yeah, no kidding, huh? There we go. I, get, I, I knew that because I didn't see you here. Uh, kind of go towards the number 2 on the lake. You know, you see his facing dial spinning. Do you see that little yellow arrow, guys? That's that facing thing that we were talking about. I have to prove yeah. his, I have to prove his movement. Uh, let me show you guys. I'm gonna I'm gonna unlock tokens. I think I'm gonna unlock. Okay, so unlock tokens. Now go ahead and move again. I didn't have to approve it because it's unlocked. By default, they're locked. But, um, yeah, and you see which way he's moving. So say he, he goes here, and this is how we do stuff in Dungeons, especially, you know, in like a Pathfinder and Dungeons and & Dragons. I don't play in the story. I play off these pins. Oh, i got to move these one second. So as my players get to that area, I can click the pin, and the story will pop up for that instead. Right do now. you have to pre-position the pin? No, no. With the adventure, it comes that way. That was already there by default. Oh, okay. You do if you homebrew and build something from scratch. And all you would do, so I'll give you an example of this, you would grab the TAS symbol, and you would just drag and drop it where you want it on the map as it comes across. Yep, Mr. Oh, okay. Mr. Yell says, as a player, he doesn't see him. If I do want them to see him, I could right-click on the map and make link shareable. Now it's green, and he could see that. But now he has access to all this information that only the ref should see. So I'm going to go ahead and set it back. Make link private again. You may already have this information now. Okay, so this is good. This is the exact place I want to be to show you guys the final part of the class is managing an encounter. So here on the lake, as the party gets close to this 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 pin, uh, seven point zero two company, uh, what it does is triggers a battle map scene. So uh, I'm going to close this. I'm going to open my battle map. This should be familiar. I could kind of move stuff around, just kind of fit on my screen. Oh, uh, that's right. You couldn't load that. You see, Mr. Yellow's chat. Remember, I, uh, good point. The module, sorry, I'm bouncing. He had an error because it asked him if he wanted to load the module. Well, it was it's an X. It's player block, so he can't load it. So he was getting that error. So that's cool. So sorry. So we're gonna prep for this encounter, guys. So the first thing I'm gonna do, uh, I'm gonna prep this by adding a layer of a uh, hex, a hex layer, right? So I'm gonna right-click on my map. I'm gonna go to layers here around the five o'clock position. I'm gonna do set grid. By default, it's gonna be a square. Uh, we, we'll change that after we lay it down. And you just kind of drag it, right? And that looks about right to me. That's how I want it. All right, I'm gonna right click. I'm gonna go to layers one more time. And I'm gonna change this to hex by, by going to grid type. And I like the hex column grid. Uh, I find that if you use the hex row grid, it tilts the token sideways. So I go hex column grid. Now we have a hex battle map. We're gonna, Mr. The, we're gonna get rid of fake player because he's only playing with one player right now. So Mr. The Yellow. I'm gonna put them on my map and any other players in my combat tracker. All right, next up, I'm gonna load the battle, which is a Tenshir's Wolf. 
by hitting, let me slow back, let me go back. Click on battle because it's nested in my story. I don't have to find it in this button here. It's just right here, battle. I get to add it to the combat tracker, the Chancellor's Wolf, by clicking this down arrow. It automatically populated here. I have information on this Tensor's Wolf either by clicking this TAS symbol or the one in the combat tracker. There's so many, it's everything's so linked together, it's all the same. And I can click there. And I have the information on the Tensor's Wolf, it has 36 hit points, as you guys may know if you've encountered this thing, or two of them. Uh, and I remember, I was saying, remember the images, it's nested in other locations, so it is nested in the NPC sheet. I could share this with my players. So, a um, Mr. The Yellow, as you're approaching the lake, uh, a four-legged creature starts uh, stalking up on you. It looks like this, right? And now I know he's looking at what I'm saying. It looks like this, All right? And then I tell him, roll for initiative. So, Mr. The Yellow can roll for initiative on his character sheet. Um, if you've played it before, it's in the actions tab. I am going to roll for the uh, NPC by going to menu initiative here at nine o'clock and then I'm going to roll NPC initiatives. All right, Tensor Wolf automatic. You didn't see a die roll come across. It's just automated in the combat tracker. So Tensor Wolf coming out of the shadows stalking Mr. The Yellow. All right, and he's got a bunch of movement. I'll prove his movement. All right. It Did does you, on Perfect. that map, was there a, a, a dot already there, one of those stickies for the, the Tensor Wolf? Or did you drag him and drop him on the map? Uh -huh. So this this adventure already had him placed on the map. That was his pre-position. Oh, okay. Mr. The Yellow, here's your map. So this Tensor's Wolf started making a move on you. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna end it in my NPC turn. It's gonna go to Mr. Yellow. Probably got a dinging sound. All right, he's got in Traveler. He's got a uh, a free action, a minor action, and a uh, like I always say major action, but it is a significant action. All right, so he knows the rules, so he's going to aim. So he's going to control and left-click to target either on the map or in the combat tracker. As the ref, you just want to watch to make sure they have the right target. All right, Mr. Yellow, go ahead and make your attack roll. All right, he's got a hit. Go ahead and roll for damage, and then we'll see that this will get automated. All right. So a bunch of the armor shrug, got sh shrugged that off, but he still took uh, five wounds on our end. We know that. The player does not know that. He will only see what what uh, what what does it say right now on your Tensor's Wolf? Does it say? Just like wounded or lightly wounded or something like that? Oh, there, there you go, light wounds. So that's all you know is, 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 is it's got light wounds. Next up, uh, we go ahead and pass your turn, Mr. The Yellow, if you're done. I, I have my players pass it. It's in the same location. It just instead of saying next actor, I believe it says end turn. And uh, if they don't do that, then you, you have to ask them if you want them to pass it for them, which you could do, or you tell your players to tell me. But oh, turn complete. All right. That's what that says on their end. All right, so now the Tensor's Wolf, it's my turn. I'm gonna come up and I'm gonna maul uh, Mr. The Yellow. I did my movement. I'm gonna target him by holding Control and left click. All right, I don't play, you know, you, you guys, if you've played Traveler or any other game, you, you play out of your character sheet. As a ref, you don't do that. You play right out of the combat tracker. So I have my attack die, which is right here, and my damage die, and my range. I just simply, once I have Mr. The Yellow, my target targeted, I double click. It's a double click. All right. Average success, I get some bonus damage. And here is the chomp. Grr. All right, and 
He's, he's, his damage, his, his endurance got reduced to three already. It was automated. As a ref, I didn't have to do any of the calculations. I could just kind of make sure I just read through so you and make sure that the, the proper damage was applied. So six went through. Looks like his armor shrugged off five. He says in, his, in the chat there that he clicks and drags the attack damage from the combat tracker to the token on the map. Why do that if it's automated? Uh, okay, so here, here I'm gonna untarget Mister the Yellow. This is this is good. So I don't have a target. I could just play like this. I could grab this and drop it over Mister the Yellow. All right. And then does it done. automatically target him? No. Then I still have to drag and drop the damage to him too. It's oh, okay. really your style, how you want to do it. So targeting's not necessarily required. Correct. You yeah. can do it on the fly like that. Yeah, you, you do have to, and he can do, and on his side, I'll show you what the character sheet, just so you all know. He could do the same thing out of his character sheet. He could he could make his attack roll on the Tentra's Wolf this way. But the problem is, as a ref, if your players are doing this, you don't see, because uh, you want to have that targeted, right? You won't see what they're doing until the dice rolls start coming through. Huh. And then, and it does, there's not much AOE in this game, but say there's a hand grenade, right? Oh. Right, and it, and it could target multiple cr creatures. Then, then you'd want to instead of dragging and dropping it one at a time on each one, you can just target them all at once and just roll the dice, and it'll just automate everything. How did you target them all at once? All right. So let me throw down a couple tensors. Wolf. Let's drag and drop, drag and drop. And I guess they got to go on the map. All right. So now there's, there's three baddies. Go ahead, Mr. The Yellow. There you go. So he's he's holding down control and left clicking. He's got one, five, and three targeted now. And then give me a single attack roll. We'll just call it a grenade. And not, not the drag and drop method, but the double click out of the action tab. Right, see all the dice that just came through? It's throwing on a on a single on a single double click for him. It it went to all the ones he had targeted. And I go ahead and roll for damage. There you go. Kaboom. Oh, man. Huh. All right, so that grenade just killed our Tenture's wolves. All right, so I'll go ahead and delete them off the map. Even though it didn't, but we say it did. Oh. All right. Yeah. That was a plasma grenade. Cool. Hey, I have a question real quick. I don't know if this is like a one on two question or not, uh, or it. if this is possible. So, I know for those type of equipment that could work for the players, but what about like uh, heavy weapons, like, you know, turrets or uh, uh, what's it called? Or like heavy weapons on vehicles? Like, how would you allow the players to control that and or roll, you know, actual damage and or for that specific equipment? Yeah, that's actually, for me, I, we found in our session, what we did was we turned on the, um, remember that option, uh, the house rule allow them to have something over 100 kilograms? Yes. We, we did that, and then, then we, I, for that that scene in the story, then I let them to manage that big-ass weapon okay, by, by, so. by, put it, by putting it in their inventory. Oh, okay, got so it. So now, Mr. The Yellow, yeah. let's, let's find something. It's in our items, right? In uh, in five e, uh, if if I have a player controlling something else like that, I I give them access to it. I in the items, I find it, drag it over to their to their uh, icon, and it and the, and the item thing shows up in their on their screen, and they can just drag the damage from the pay the item page uh, to the uh, thing that they want to attack, and it lets them basically control it. Yeah, so say, say like Mr. The Yellow, I'm giving him access to a heavy Gauss cannon and using the back of an ATV or something that has one. I just drag it to his inventory now. He's, and I allow that. He's at over 2,000, but we allow that, right? Now that's on his action tab, and now we could operate the heavy Gauss cannon that way. All right, cool. Thank you. It's a 2DD. <laughs> 50 and a 40. What was that option you, you clicked? I missed that option. Yeah, so up in the options. I went down is a house rule. 
and I allow heavy weapons over a thousand kilograms in the inventory. And that, oh, okay. that, that's what allowed uh, the player agency to operate that weapon off the character sheet. Okay, cool. Those are house rules that come with Fantasy Grounds, or did you have to write that and put it in? Nope, that came with the vanilla potato Fantasy Grounds. Do you find that that plays havoc with the encumbrance rules? Oh, yeah. Or if the encumbrance rules are, are, are implemented, wouldn't that automatically give you minuses to things? If you're putting that gun in their inventory? Um, I don't know that it does because... It can. It's just that you have to probably tell it to set it to zero. Yeah, you, you, you do have to double check because you would have to go to the Mr. the Yellow and go to the actions and then, and then make sure that you're... Uh, where is it? Heavy Goss is set straight. So that's good that it's minus three. Uh, right. But we, we probably, I don't know if, if I set it to dex, if that'll actually account for the encumbrance or not. We could check. Yeah, I, 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 the inventory. You just go directly to the inventory and see if it does. Yeah. But, yeah. See, it says the negative three heavily encumbered because you have, he has it like. Yeah, he equipped. does the mod, yeah, mod. So we could, I don't know if I could change that. No, you just changed the uh, weight in his sheet. Just to oh, it. that's a good. That's a great idea. Yeah, you just change that to zero for now. Can you? Right. Or you can oh, you? Oh, I uh, see. Right. Can you put a tensure's wolf on the uh, on the on the map real quick? Of course. Or do you want to smoke? What's... Let's smoke a Walston. NPCs. Sure. <laughs> Whatever it is. Here's a here's a mean old Walston coming on the map, and let me show him. He didn't get fed. He's he's gnarly now. So go ahead, uh, I'll let you take over on what you want to test. Oh, make sure you press enter. Hmm. Oh, that, that didn't uh, do what I thought it was going to do. I was going to try to f fire it from the from the uh, item itself, but it, I guess it doesn't uh, do that. No, you can do the actions tab. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Fair enough. All right, and we got a few minutes. I got. I still got to show you one thing now. Say, say, um. Oh well, this Walston, uh, you scare him away with your Gauss cannon. Oh God. And uh, he had a. Um, he was he was guarding the bodies, two dead bodies of of, of some travelers that that crash landed over here right um we we could add those items to the uh, party sheet i'm going to close this map we're not we don't need it anymore i'm going to close the story item we're kind of past that it's got to cover this party sheet so at the end of the encounter uh we award the items that that are found uh, it could be that you just take it out of the items portion of the game and say they had a uh what well, looks fun you know they had their uh you know well, I'm on weapons, that's why. A Vulcan machine gun, All right? And we put that in, in the party sheet that way. Or uh, there is a parcel system, uh, but they call it, um, well, there is parcels here. Uh, there are no parcels uh, that came with the game, so that's it's going to just be this way. You have uh, to build them. Yeah, the parcel you have to build, and it, it, it just, it, it, what it is is just multiple items. But now I'm gonna do two of them real quick because we uh, to show, show how this works. Okay, so Mister the Yellow, he can grab this Vulcan machine gun, just one of them, by grabbing the TAS symbol and dragging it and dropping it to your inventory. You can see that one, and party that Mister the Yellow's got the sub, the machine gun. Or there's predictive text as a ref. I could award it to my players as I see fit. I could type in Mister. It does not like your name. Well, let's see where it goes. Uh, then you should just hit distribute. Yeah, so it doesn't recognize Mr. The Yellow. I wonder why. Oh, are you in my main tab? Haha, <laughs> it's fake player. Dummy. Minor details, right? Yeah, well, yeah, things matter. Okay, let me go back. So now I should do the predictive text now that he's in there. Yeah. 
and it's failing. Hey, let me change the name to just yellow, and that oh, yeah. might yeah. change it. it. Yeah, it's just yellow now. <clears throat> No, I don't like it. It. Let me let me try fake. Yeah, so where are you at that you're negative eight time stamp? California. Uh oh. Okay. Yep, so real quick you can see the predictive text because fake player was probably because I added you after I put in the item. That's probably the order matters as well. So you can see it starts doing a predictive and then once you get the player that's gonna get assigned, you hit enter. Uh, you could do a comma and you could add more and more players if there's multiple items. But then I do could hit this uh, distribute, and then I went to fake player. And that that's exactly at the two hour mark. Look at that. And we can see. Well done. We can see Ooh. fake player should now have the Vulcan machine gun. Cool. And I was gonna add something. Uh, you have to be careful and stay on top of the party sheet if you have players that didn't show up for the session or something because uh, you know if you're distributing credits or something like that they would get distributed to players that weren't actually there um, and it's a GM call yeah and then this for instance I put a 10,000 credits say there was a bounty right and I could just do um, distribute All right, and distribute it across the party 10,000 they each got 5,000 a piece it did the math it automated it But you're saying, yeah, but what, what exactly what you're saying is say say uh, from the last session, uh, fake didn't come to this session, but he's still in here. He would have just split the loot with whoever was here. How did you how did you separate or how did how did you do that like five thousand credit oh, thing again? It just it so I I awarded a ten thousand. We'll call it a ten thousand and one just because it'll be interesting. Okay. So say there was a. Uh, um, a reward for killing that Walston, right? That's what they went yeah. to the top of the mountain for. We're just saying. It's going to distribute it as evenly as it can amongst the main tab players. So whoever's in here. And what I did is I hit this down, distribute assignment and credits. Oh, okay. And then because there's two, uh, that one credit is left over because it wasn't divisible by two, and it just stays in there until we get more credits. Oh, okay. Now, at the very beginning, you said something about that you were talking about credits, and you said you have to use caps, um, you know, the, the proper uh, letter case, because it matters to the programming. Yeah. So if I add um, edit list, it, it, it's traveler is not going to matter. Everything's in credits, but uh, you see it a lot in, uh, say, like D and D five e. There's a difference between uh -huh. a capital GP, a capital G, and a lowercase p, and a lowercase g and a lowercase p. Uh, so you do have to make sure that we are C capital C R because in our in our uh, our setup that's what we were using for currency. Okay, I'm tracking. Yeah. Very good. Really good job. My brain feels full. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. That was that was that was quick. There's a lot a lot of stuff we didn't cover, but. That was that is the meat and potatoes of roughing though. That was your GM one oh one. GM one oh two will build on the skills that you learn if you're able to make that class.